In this chapter, we deal with Faraday's law. Qualitatively speaking, last chapter we dealt with either the Biot-Savar law or Ampere's law, which talked about how having some kind of current in space creates magnetic fields, which ends up going in a circle, etc., etc. It turns out you can also manipulate magnetic field to give you current, and that's qualitatively what Faraday's law is all about. Specifically and quantitatively, it gets written in a little bit of a funny way because the relationship is not as direct as we might hope. It's not that if you have magnetic field in space, it generates current. It's a little different than that. Faraday's law is written as this funny thing, which actually, by the looks of it, doesn't involve current or magnetic field directly. But we'll have to go through and unpack each part of this thing. This epsilon sign here stands for EMF, which is a historical archaic term, super misnomer. That stands for electromotive force, but it has nothing to do with forces. In fact, it's very much less like a force and much more like a voltage. You can almost think of this as the source voltage of a battery, and it is in fact measured in volts. And this is voltage that drives a current through a certain resistance. That's where the current is hidden. I R, and that's where my current sits. This thing here, you would have no recognized the symbol as magnetic flux. We've talked about this briefly during Gauss's law discussion. Magnetic flux, of course, stands for the integral of your magnetic field going through a certain bit of area, and you. Integrate throughout over that area. Notice there's no little circle here. We're not talking about a closed surface, as in Gauss's law. We're talking about once again an open surface, but enclosed by a certain loop. Here's your total surface, and then for each little piece of dA, we have a magnetic field that goes through it, and then for each dA, we have a normal vector. Do the dot product, sum, 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 sum. So to get that flux. And it is around this loop that that encloses that area that we can talk about this electromotive force, which again is a delta v. So that's where your magnetic field comes from. So they are hidden in there; it's just written a little funny. And of course, like any flux, the angle is going to matter. If you have a magnetic field off, the dot product is going to be affected. So make sure to keep that into account. So it turns out, it's not the amount of field, or even the amount of flux that determines how much current you get. It's how these quantity changes over time. You need to have a changing flux in order to generate current. That's how it was observed. So we have to take care of that. So we'll see how that plays out in terms of calculation, etc. This next part, of course, n is the number of loops. So if you have instead of one wire loop, you have many many loops all stacked up. Then of course you're multiplying that effect n times. And this negative sign here gives the direction, and that's Lenz's law. And we'll talk about it in a subsequent video that specifically talks about direction. So just for now, we'll stick with the magnitudes as a first step. I will stress again that similar to Ampere's law, we do have to draw a loop in space. Usually, there is a wire that comprises such a loop. So this is definitely the flux through that loop, and then this is delta v around such loop. So let's think. Let's see what this loop is about. Okay. So here we're actually doing question twenty-five. Because that's the one with the funny angles, but it refers to the last one, so I pasted that question in here anyways. It involves a 50 turn coil, so we know n is equal to 50. So we have a coil in space with 50 turns. Maybe it's really tight, maybe it's really long. It doesn't really matter. And then we know a certain radius. The coil is placed in a spatially uniform magnetic field. So the plane of the coil, say. Something like that. It's making a 30 degrees angle with the magnetic field, and this is the same throughout the entire area, basically. Now, of course, it's not the angle of the plane that matters, like any dot product, because we're doing 
b dot n for the flux, we need to talk about the normal vector. So in fact, the angle we're talking about, theta in this case, is equal to 60 degrees. So that's great, we have a magnetic field through a coil. But again, it's not the fact that you have a magnetic field, it's that you have a magnetic field that changes. So what happens to this magnetic field? This magnetic field starts out with 0.5 Tesla, but it reduces to zero uniformly over 0.1 seconds. Yeah, I, I know it, we're trying to refer to two separate questions here, so it looks a little confusing, but just bear with me. So one step at a time, we're trying to find EMF, and I will just refer to this as EMF because I don't want to give credence to that word force ever again. So to do so, we first have to find the flux, and then we have to find how the flux changes in time, and then we get everything. So let's find the flux first. The flux is that, and we already know that b dot n can be evaluated as the magnitude of b times the magnitude of n, which is 1, cosine theta, which in this case happens to be 90 minus 30 degrees for part a. And so we can replace this with the magnitude of b cosine theta dA, which for each of the little area all over that circle enclosed by the coil would have the same b at any given time because it's spatially uniform. And then the cosine theta is also the same. So then those can come out, which then lets us say, oh, well, that's just the total area by r squared. Now, they gave us diameter, so r is just half of that. Sneaky, sneaky. And I'm going to change it to meters anyways. So that's a flux. But again, we don't want flux. We want the DDT of the flux. When we talk about the change in time of flux, flux is, of course, this thing. So you can have either the magnetic field changes or the area changes, or you can also have the orientation changes. So all those things. But in this case, we only have the magnetic field changing because the coil is not changing area and we're not twisting and reorienting that coil. So you take this expression and you derive it. Cosine theta remains constant in time. Pi is a constant. The radius is not changing. So all you have left is the change of magnetic field over time. And they tell us that this magnetic field starts out at 0.5 Tesla and drops down to zero uniformly, straight line, so this is uniformly, to zero over 0 0.1 second. So that slope is, because it's a straight line, becomes delta B delta T, and so we can plug that in. So we're very, very close here. So give myself a little more space, plugging into Faraday's law, then we can finish it off as the magnitude of this EMF is equal to, we can drop that negative sign because we're just dealing with magnitude, n times this expression. So that's cosine theta pi r squared delta b over delta t with the absolute value sign because what we have is we're losing magnetic field, so technically it's negative 0.5 Tesla over 0.1 second, pi 7.5 centimeters. Uh, you have cosine in this case 60, and you have 50 turns. You plug that on your calculator, and you end up getting basically 2.2 volts. So a fairly substantial magnetic field gives you a fairly substantial voltage. And then part B and C is very similar. Moving back up a bit, part B and C simply has the plane making an angle of 60, so theta here is 30, and then here theta is 0. So then we just plug in the same numbers again, and same expression, except this is now 30 and 0, so we'll get different numbers and nothing more to go through really, so this becomes basically 4.4. And that's how we use Faraday's law. It might seem like there's lots of steps 
but it's usually always the same step. Hopefully through more practice, it'll make a little more sense.